Hey everybody, I'm Charles Butler. I work on the uh, Kubernetes team at uh, Canonical. So I'm a co-author of the uh, Canonical distribution of Kubernetes charts. And along that path, uh, we did a lot of investigation into the different components. And one of the more interesting components to me was etcd. Uh, if you're not familiar with etcd, at its core, it's just a distributed key value store that allows you to put persist data across a cluster of machines. And it's used in a lot of different solutions. Um, and along that vein, I started running the numbers before I came up here to give this talk because I hadn't really checked it, just what we were doing with the charm and, and what the actual metrics look like, but it's being deployed roughly every 30 minutes, every day. That blew my mind. I'm like, wait, people are really using our NCD. This is awesome. This means that we have a pretty good solution here. Now, just a little bit of note on those numbers. This does include CI efforts that are run outside of Canonical. We tend to not inflate the numbers whenever we have control over that, but uh, it does also include some like on-site tests and drive-by deployments. But uh, NCD is used in a lot of different places. First and foremost being in uh, the Canonical distribution of Kubernetes. And this is where I've got the most familiarity with NCD and using it. But it's, it's the same service whenever you used it in Swarm. Uh, this was before they pulled everything inside on the 1.12 and pretty much said, you know, all external components take the boot. Uh, it's also being used in a partner OpenStack distribution. So if you deploy with Calico, uh, you're using our NCD charm which is fantastic. And this basically means that it's, oh, it's, it's also better than just about everything that CoreOS has ever done ever. Um, but NCD is literally everywhere. And that to me just means that it's becoming more and more important portion of our infrastructure. We really have to have a deep understanding of how this application behaves and what its domains are. But <laughs> despite the fact that it's going everywhere, devs and operators still have this mental block where I like you, but I don't trust you. NCD is probably the biggest you know, finicky thing in my deployment, and I, I just I don't I don't know that I like running this in production yet. But you know what? That's okay. You can have that mindset, but just remember that out of every flavor that you could have chosen, you chose to be salty, and we're going to remove those mind blocks today with just some basics. So, some of this may seem like common sense to you. We're going to talk about things like backups and how to probe health and things of that nature, but these are all very important building blocks to understanding how we can actually interface with NCD and not have to have a constant fear of something happening in production that's going to catch things on fire and create great panic. So, the first basic that I'm going to tell you is probably something that nobody wants to hear, but please read the fine manual. The admin guide has got everything you're going to need to know to get started with understanding how to run NCD in production. Uh, they do have a V2. I'm not certain where they're at with their V3 guide, but uh, everything's posted and it's got a lot of great information. The first and foremost is probably the most often question that I am asked. How many units of NCD do I need to run to uh, basically work with fault tolerance? And the idea behind this is that there's a majority and there's peers and then that's going to dictate how much uh, failure that it can tolerate and still manage to keep quorum. <coughs> And quorum is a very important thing in NCD since it's RAF based. If it loses quorum and deadlocks itself, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> um, but the remainder of that is uh, it'll teach you how to deal with network partitions and how NCD itself will self heal uh, when working with network partitions. Uh, it also talks about uh, the election deadlock we just briefly touched on, um, what your hardware requirements should be in order to deploy NCD. It's a very high throughput database, so this key value store is going to be very hungry in terms of RAM and disk I.O. Uh, but the two bottlenecks that they will call out specifically are network I.O. and your disk I.O. Uh, you also need to understand their uh, representation of the disposable infrastructure model. Uh, we're going to touch more on that uh, deeper later. But along this vein, there were also some interesting things that they didn't cover in the admin guide that I found by talking with uh, Josh Dumars. Uh, and he wrote this repository called Etsy Death. It's not a very highly published repository. I don't know that, I didn't really ask him if I could put this on the slide, so I hope he's okay with this. But uh, it, he has some amazing ways to kill Etsy D. Um, I covered out all of his failure scenarios here where we're doing interesting things like colo, data, uh, security, like so if a uh, developer releases bad IP tables, rule sets, and it effectively blocks out like the peer communication ports, what happens to etcd when that happens. Um, <laughs> reboot it, uh, have mismatched versions, uh, things of that nature. So I highly encourage you, if you're going to be running etcd in production, to check this out uh, once you get a little more familiar with etcd and run through the failure domains. <coughs> so let's talk about basic number two. 
we're going to TLS wrap our cluster endpoints always and forever. Why? Because etcd is used as a coordinator and it's the persistent store for a lot of distributed applications, giving anyone access to that out of the gate over unencrypted, non-verified connections just means that you've basically given them root to your cluster. They can modify some keys, run some Docker containers that you weren't expecting them to run, and bam, all of a sudden you're compromised. That's a scary thought. Now the first way to really do this is not only to limit access to firewalls, but as a very first step to this is at least authenticate those requests with TLS keys. Um, and if you have a mental block where you don't want to put SSL keys all over your infrastructure, you can run an etcd proxy. And then that will allow you to make unencrypted requests locally on the machine, and it will pipeline those over to your etcd cluster in, on a TLS connection, which is a fantastic way to model this. Uh, so there's literally no excuse to not do this at this point. We made this mandatory about four months ago in the Juju Charms when you Juju deploy etcd. It will complain at you that it cannot find the certificate authority if, it doesn't, if it's not related to one and doesn't have the keys. So the idea behind this is that it's no longer optional. You have to do it if you want to enforce security out of the gate. And if you're using another solution that's not Juju based, pardon me, uh, etcd now has the uh, capacity to generate self-signed PKI infrastructure as of the v3 <coughs> update, which is fantastic. So just get that in there, make sure that you're using the TLS keys, and we'll move on to basic number three. Etcd is a RESTful service. So, at the end of the day, at the bare minimum, if you have no other monitoring infrastructure, set up a curl on the health endpoint. And that will give you some basic insight to what's happening in your cluster per unit, which is fantastic. So you have options at how to do this health monitoring. That was just the basic. Uh, you can run a constant loop of etcd cover cluster health. Um, it also has baked in support for Prometheus. I believe that that landed in the two series of etcd. And uh, if you're relating that, you can set up some awesome, uh, uh, you know, I think I have a slide for that. So, so let me pull back just a little bit. So the way that I've modeled this in Juju for the very basic health checks is just in the Juju status output. On the top, we see that we have five healthy, uh, five healthy units. Uh, now, whenever there's some shenanigans happening, we have a little bit of an indicator here uh, that it has no known peers. What I actually did was I just remoted into the unit, shot it in the head, and it did not recover. <laughs> so. It was still checking the health of the cluster, but it did know that it didn't have any peers because it was trying to pull itself. So the etcd protocol was still working. It was able to discover that it had a cluster that it should be a part of, but it could not contact any of the peers because its own, uh, its own service was offline. But if you're going to go in and start experimenting with the Prometheus uh, code that they have baked in for monitoring, you too can have a great Profana dashboard that uh, They've got example repositories with this out there where you get things like the, the disk speed, the disk I.O., the memory pressure, uh, how much CPU time the uh, database is, uh, is currently cycling on. It's, it's, just, it's great, and it's a freebie. So now we're going to get to the meat of what I really want to talk about, and this is how to back up your cluster regularly. If you're not actively doing this, you're going to have a bad time if anything ever does go wrong with etcd. Okay, so backing up your cluster is a fairly straightforward process. You run a cluster, you only need to target one because it distributes the data. So you can target any uh, unit in your cluster and uh, tell it to execute a backup. We've encapsulated this in Juju with an action, which is repeatable operational code that you can run as an administrator. Uh, it will give you back some, uh, some additional commands out of the action output, but you can, uh, it basically just executes the backup, gives you a tarball that you can then uh, pull off of your unit. And uh, this also will tie in with the next slide where you can take that particular backup snapshot and test it on your laptop. It's a great way to go through and actually work with this backup and validate that it's worked before you uh, archive it. If you're running this in Docker style, it's just a single command. You, you typically want to terminate your consumers so that way you can have some guarantee of the consistency of your data. The last thing you want to do is execute a backup when there's a large operation happening in your cluster. Uh, at this point, you just point it at your data dir, your write-ahead log dir, and uh, it will basically perform the same thing. So the next one, of course, since we're talking about backups, the next logical step is to start testing those backups at every opportunity that you get. Because you want to have that faith that what you have there is, is a full, consistent backup. So again, we've encapsulated this in Juju very simple. Uh, you just take that same tarball that you got from the backup action, and you attach it to the charm as a resource. What that's doing is it's just uploading the tarball, it takes no action on initial upload. You have to manually invoke 
the, uh, the restore, in which case it will stop all services, unpack the backup, stand your service back up. So when we were working through this initially, we found that there were some interesting scenarios that happened uh, in the context of mm -hmm. Kubernetes. If you're familiar with Kubernetes, uh, you may not be so familiar with the fact that all of its data objects get what's called a resource version. And resource versions are internal identifiers that Kubernetes uses to track the evolution of your deployment. So this will, by performing a restore in the context of Kubernetes, one of four things is going to happen. Everything went great. Your cluster state was preserved. You were able to effectively uh, restore from state, and life is good. <clears throat> the second is arguably a little worse. Uh, you lost resource versions, and the Kubernetes uh, master control plan will then have to infer what it should be. And you should eventually uh, eventual consistency where it's going to pull that back from the API server. Now, worst possible case scenario, or arguably worst, po uh, worst scenario, is that you'll get stale resource versions. And that will cause your workloads to roll back. And that can have some seriously unintended side effects uh, on your running workloads. For example, say that you've issued at least four different uh, patch releases. And your manifest, now that it's uh, currently got in the etcd state, uh, is two versions behind. That can cause things to crash loop. And it's not really uh, indicating why that's the case. So we have to do some manual investigation. Now the worst, worst possible scenario that we found. <laughs> it actually took a little bit of work to get there. But the Kube API state is going to be mismatched with what is supposed to be in the database. And the data, a, re <laughs> a reboot happens. Things are fine. Or things are on fire. And this is fine. Meme happens. And you just don't really know what's going on. So we had a community member that actually was running through this. And he did some very specific operations to encounter this scenario. And we had no idea how this was happening. He was able to reproduce it. And we couldn't figure out what exactly uh, the problem was, initially, it probably took a good three, four hours of investigation. So he deployed a, 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 a canonical distribution to Kubernetes cluster and deployed some large workloads, was doing testing, everything was working fantastically well. And he was in the process of deleting a large namespace, which is the logical grouping of all those objects. So while it was running through that, he's like, I'm going to try to produce some extra work on, this, on the, these different components. So he remotes into his etcd unit and he rebooted the etcd server during this delete operation. Why that was a good idea, I don't know. But he, he came into this, and it was, it was fantastic, because after that, he rebooted the Kubernetes master unit, because he couldn't figure out what things were crash looping. And between losing the state in both his master control plane and his backup of the etcd service, it never really recovered. It was deadlocking at that point. And it was kind of a sad bit. We were able to get him up and running again by redeploying his cluster, restoring from his manifest files. But the fact that he had kind of corrupted that state in both places, left him in a very, very bad position. So lessons were learned. So this is where we get into the point where we have to embrace the disposable infrastructure mantra. This is something that the, the authors, Core OS of FNCD, have really taken to the next level. Like I'm sure you've heard the old mantra of uh, machines are, are, are cattle, not pets. So Let's, let's enter a, a fictitious scenario where we've deployed etcd. We have a, a cluster of four units. And suddenly, one day, uh, one says, man, I'm misconfigured. I can no longer contact my peers. I'm having a bad day. So you get an angry etcd. And then that starts to propagate. And you're like, man, I don't know what's happening, but I've got this one. My leader is still, is still acting just fine. Life is good. So the way to recover from that is very simple. Delete the notes. You wouldn't think that that's the case, but delete the notes. It's OK. Run your backup, spin up either a new cluster and run the restore from a snapshot, or just add another unit if it's still in, in good health. And what's going to happen is that the leader is going to say, I am the decider. I have all this data. I'm going to transfer my state to you, and it's going to be fine. We will recover from this. So you scale back up. You have five nodes now. You no loss, uh, no loss state. Not too shabby, right? So we can take this even further. And we can start talking about performance. I thought I had another slide in here, but apparently I cut it. Um, <laughs> but the idea behind this is that NTD was made to heal from different things, like uh, random disk failure, network partitions, and other such uh, oddities that you'll find in the data center, and leverage that. Don't just blindly distrust an application because you don't understand its behavior domain. So speaking more of that, 
we have a way that we can increase performance. And if you're running a high capacity, high throughput uh, cluster, you're going to want to separate two things. You're going to want to put your data on a fast SSD, and you're going to want to put your write ahead log on an equally fast SSD. But uh, the point behind this is that whenever etcd runs operations, it batches them. And with these batches, it uses the write ahead log, and I'm not real positive about the internals of this, but I do know that it, it batches those, and that's what the, the purpose of the write-ahead log is. So if you split those up, you get faster disk I.O., which should turn into faster etcd. And we've encapsulated ways to do this today in the charm. There's probably a little bit more to do here, but uh, it's a great way to get started. By just putting your data pack on a persistent disk, which gives you a little more guarantees of uh, consistency, as well as snapshot support, and uh, starting with the, uh, <coughs> with the performance gains. So now we're going to get into a little more specifics. Uh, NCD3 came out about six months ago. It's becoming more and more important in the community that we start the upgrade process and we move from this older version of NCD into, into the new age. And with the NCD3 upgrade path, they did something fantastically well. They decided to enable API compatibility. And what this means to you as an operator is that you can start deploying these new NCD nodes and trying to get them to join in your cluster but they're going to be reduced down to just the least common version identifier. So if you have a two series deployed, it will downgrade, and everything will speak etcd2. And that's what this illustration is showing, that it doesn't matter that you have all these nodes that are actually deployed on three, it'll run a 2.2 compatibility mode until everything is updated to the correct version and you have the correct flag set. This is going to save you a ton of headache during the update. So. Uh, the other option that you have really is to redeploy on top of three and start fresh. Uh, you, you run the dumps and restore from a snapshot, and that is a, a viable path forward. Hey, everybody? Yeah. All yeah. right, so until you feel comfortable, uh, start small and work your way forward. You don't have to take a nine node etcd cluster out for a walk in the park day one. You can, we, we try to make it easy for you to do that, but until you get comfortable with those domains, start small and understand the behavior of the application and what's happening whenever you start introducing uh, different changes. Uh, the final bit that I, I really want to cover in this is use benchmarking to validate your deployments. etcd doesn't really talk about this a lot, but they wrote a benchmarking tool and they published some simple numbers. And <coughs> what's fantastic is that uh, I'm going to ship this with the one with the etcd three update in the chart. So every time that you deploy etcd now, you can just run an action, point it at your endpoints, tell it uh, all the different parameters that you want, and it will sp spit back uh, performance numbers. This is a great way for you to kind of figure out how your deployment formation is going to do whenever you actually put it into production. So you can get some baseline metrics. So the very, very last thing that I can impart <coughs> is that despite your best efforts and all the pre-planning that you're going to do, unexpected things will happen. Plan for the worst. So whenever you see an angry etcd, you don't have to run. It's OK. You've trained for this day, Balboa. You got this. All right, so I'm going to do something a little interesting here. And I have run a deployment of Kubernetes in the cloud. Let's see if it's completed. All right, so my cloud deployment's done. Let me juju switch to my LexD controller. It looked to me like that one was not completed. Yeah, it looks like I'm not getting. Yeah, you're fighting Wi-Fi. All right, but what I can do, so I'm going to choose you add model etcd2. I'm going to just go ahead and we'll deploy etcd containers, and we'll spawn easy RSA, easy RSA and etcd. OK, so in this particular model, we're just what I did and ran through extremely fast without explaining to anyone is I just added a model. So now I've got a fresh namespace for me to work with. And I've started deploying the different components that can be required to run NCD. I deployed NCD itself. I'm getting one unit of that. And I also deployed EZRSA, which is our uh, public key or private key infrastructure for the, the TLS certificates. Uh, the relation is what's going to establish the uh, the, the pipeline between etcd and EZRSA to actually transfer and request those certificates so we can get its uh, proper subject vault names embedded in those certificates. <coughs> All 
All right, so if I switch into this Amazon instance and I run GG status, let me actually run this as format equals short. Okay, so this is a, a super condensed version of that GG status. I've run a deployment of <coughs> Kubernetes core. We see that we have NCD and EZRSA deployed. We also have our Kubernetes master unit, our worker unit, and we have two flannels that are attached that are providing the overlay networking. So my thought was, I've got this Kubernetes cluster here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to run an action. And I'm gonna say run the microbot action just to launch an example workload. Replicas is gonna equal 15. Work. Is it the worker? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so in, in Juju terms, whenever you run an action, this is gonna be the initial bit that you get back. You're gonna give it some parameters and then it's gonna return that it's in queued in action because this is a, an asynchronous operation. You, you submit the request and now we can go back and we can pull with this UUID to get more information back on what's just happened. So while I'm doing this, I'm gonna grab the action output from this command. And we're going to see that it completed, and we got a little bit of an address, so we can actually visit that URL and, and go scope out the microbots. But what I'm more interested in doing now that I have the workload running is I want to run another action on my etcd unit, and I want to run the snapshot action. <coughs> so now, I'm going to give that a couple seconds to run. And whenever I show the action output from this one, there's a lot more information that's being fed back to me. The first that I'm gonna see is that at the top I have results and there's a copy key. So I can just copy and paste that command right into my console and it's gonna show me how to grab that snapshot that I just made and pull that down to my local system. Another thing that's important is I get a SHA-256 sum so I can validate the integrity of that file that I've just fetched to make sure it's one to one with what the system told me it backed up and what I've just received on my laptop. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna grab this file, put it back here on my laptop. There's a line return there, that's no good. All right. <coughs> Fetch that here. We shot 256 on that tar file. And we see that we match up with our 5AA, 5AA, 3B45. So fantastic. We've got this, this particular state. And let's go ahead and dissect what's in this tar file. <coughs> All right, so what it's actually done is it's just made a tar file <coughs> of the actual etcd directory that we would expect to find on the unit. This member directory is what's, uh, is what's in the bar directory. The snap bits are important to etcd itself, but this is the write-ahead log, and we have that write-ahead log.wall file. So we've got everything that we would expect to find in our data tree. Uh, in our data tree. So let's go ahead and switch to that LexD deployment. <clears throat> so we're going to juju attach etcd snapshot equals. be able to say something like juju run action etcd restore I need to specify my unit number all right so now I've just kicked off the restore action on that etcd unit if I run juju status I see that it's currently executing so it's still running through the steps now it's idle so I should be able to do something like let me juju ssh into this particular unit and we should see some Kubernetes details in here. So that's a decuddle ls recursive. And we see that we've got the full object tree that we just exported from our Kubernetes cluster. When we first deployed it, it was empty. Now we have the uh, different replica sets for our microbots that we launched, the, the Kubernetes system pods. So we've effectively encapsulated a way to take state from a running cluster, back it up, and we can now put it somewhere else. What I can do with this is I can actually move like a, a Kubernetes cluster, which is not really apparent because my LXD deployment's uh, halted on that, on that kubit, but uh, it's, this is fantastic because this means that 
you can effectively clone and move this. I mean, I, I don't know of any better way to put it than that. And this excites me. Because now we can get to the point where we've got our, our deployment running at Amazon, and there's this issue. It's kind of weird, and we don't understand. So we can take it, we can pull it, we can put it in a lab, and we can start poking at it in different ways. Or we can recover from failure scenarios with these backups. I mean, the, the possibilities now, the door has just been opened. And this capability has been there. Just nobody's really tapping into it. And we're starting to look at this as, as a super exciting thing. So that's basically what I had to talk about as far as the, uh, the demo. And now I would invite you to deploy it to me, run your own experiments, do your own snapshots and backups, be confident with it. And I also invite you to find us in the Kubernetes lifecycle, such as SIG Cluster Ops, uh, SIG on prem SIG lifecycle. And as always, it's available on ggcharms.com slash NCD. Are there any questions? Sure, is there a benchmarking option in the uh, GG commands? It is not today. Uh, I'm actually going to be working on this, and I plan on releasing that with the, v with the uh, NCD3 upgrade that we're going to be pushing out with our Kubernetes 1.6 update. Well, the question that Juju, does Juju provide you benchmarking, or is that early? Or, or do you, or you ask actually that repeat the question? Are? Okay, so the question was, does Juju provide benchmarking, or was it does the Juju etcd charm provide the etcd benchmarking? Right, uh, the benchmarking. Um, you said right. Was it option one or option two? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the second, answer. the second one. Okay, so correct. Uh, as of today, the etcd charm does not have the benchmark action, but that's going to be added with this next 1.6 update. Okay. Uh, what's interesting about that is that now that we have those, once we have the benchmark action, we can start to graph that and we can start to track trends with it over time using cloudbenchmarks.org. I think is still a thing. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and I think that that'll be super interesting because we can crowdsource that effort and get a solid deployment profile of what the best configurations are for running etcd. Yeah, I think it becomes super interesting when you could deploy etcd clusters on varying sizes of cluster size and, and hardware constraints and then benchmark them all, figure out like what's the best bang for buck of performance versus deployment size. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Everybody's excited they're over there running their etcd deployment. Is anyone running right etcd in production today? Yeah, anyone have any horror stories? Or? Yeah. <laughs> no? Wow. I mean, we got time. Well, yeah, because yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the biggest horror story that I have, I actually shared up here on stage, was um, with community member Zeke, who was, who was deploying his Kubernetes bits, and he was running that large delete. And then he remoted into a unit to run updates. And that was the thing that got me was whenever he started running the system updates during that operation, it never occurred to either of us to check to see if there was still operations going on in etcd. So that's, that's another thing that kind of tripped me up is I always just assumed it was kind of fast and almost instant, right? It's a key value store. Redis is super fast to respond to requests. And I realize that's comparing an apple and, and a pineapple, but uh, they have kind of the same problem to me. So whenever he ran that update, it stopped the, the etcd service, and I wouldn't have expected that to tank the rest of it, but it did. He had some trash data that got propagated, and we could not figure out how to recover from that. So not having any backups was like the next step to, to failure in that scenario. And then finally, having rebooted the API server, he lost all state. And there was no way to recover from that. So we're, we were able to recover by doing manual deployment, but it wasn't state. It was not a, a state-based resource. I had a question, actually. Um, is there a way to tell if etcd is actually churning in the background? Like, does the health status or etcd cuddle give you any information like that? You know, I know that you can get some health metrics from it, but I don't know that it's giving you back that level of stats without the Prometheus uh, integrations. So let me run etcd cluster health. Actually, I'm not on the unit. Oh, I am. So let's run etcd cuddle cluster health. And we just get that it's a healthy result member list, NCD cuddle tag H. Do we have a stats that can give us? Now this is also the 2.5 series. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing anything here for stats, so I'm, I'm fairly certain that we would have to go in and check uh, basically with uh, with the third party monitoring tool like Prometheus. Okay, cool. Because that will give you the active uh, the active stats on what's happening on the network versus disk IO as well. All right. Uh, yes. Uh, you had the slide where um, you said it was okay to remove nodes um, as long as you have this one that you can 
replicate again. But was that example of a disaster recovery scenario? Because at that time, that one remaining node can't possibly be the master, so you must take that at that point. Right? So okay, so that. It's actually a great question, but etcd does propagate its data to all of its units. Uh, to repeat the question, is this a recovery from failure scenario in this particular picture? We're deleting units after the, out of this, and we only have one good uh, healthy status report on one of these units. This is that was our that was my my benchmark for saying uh, whether you're an angry etcd or whether you're a happy etcd. So if you're still reporting good on etcd cuddle cluster health, right, and it says that everything's fine, if you can pull the data, you still get the data back. At that point, anything that relates to that is still going to get a copy of that unit's data. Whatever, the, whatever happened to the first three units is not happening, because that could be as simple as a, as a disk failure, as network partitioning, um, IP tables, <laughs> uh, data center issues, things of that nature. So I don't, you wouldn't necessarily have lost data at this point, because the one unit that's still there, every unit that's going to join it is going to receive a copy of its data. Every unit, it's, it's a replica set. Yeah, as they join. But, uh, well, yeah, in this example, of four instances, the majority would be three. Right. So as soon as you lost two, you have no master. You have no guarantee of the consistency. I see what you're saying, and that's, that's true. That's true. But that is the model that they would recommend, is that you restore from a snapshot and scale up, starting with one. So I, I guess that maybe that's what I should have, should have depicted. That's, that's very astute. Um, I have done this with the Juju charms, where I've lost uh, a couple of units. I've only lost two. Um, I have a five node cluster, which is acceptable. I uh, deleted them, added them back, and the cluster self-healed. Uh, they copied the data over it and kept going. Now, in this particular scenario where we do, we would fall back to one, you are correct. We would have lost quorum, and at that point, there's no guarantee of the consistency of the data in the key value store. Uh, what they would recommend we do at that point is you take your snapshot, your, your, your latest available snapshot, restore from that single unit, uh, and start with a single node cluster, and then you scale up from there until you reach the, uh, the required number of replicas. But uh, good call out. I did not know. Any other questions? No? All right, well, I want to thank you all for your time. It's been an excellent talk, uh, excellent demo, and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys in the workshop if you're still around. You have any questions. <laughs>